It is Wednesday afternoon, April 24th, and we'll pick up in Bear's Sheet, Genesis chapter 37. New material will start with verse 25, but what we have happening right now is we're in the midst of seeing the life of Joseph. Joseph. We're seeing how he compares to the life of Yeshua. Uh, we're on about number 26 in comparison, and we've got, we're going to go to 37 before we're done with him at this point. There's even more parallels as his life continues, but in this chapter alone we see over 30, which is amazing. Uh, but he, at this point, has come out to the field to check on his brothers. They saw him coming. They've made a plot against him, their desire to get rid of him permanently. Um, when he reached them, verse 23, when he reached them, uh, he had his multicolored tunic on. Remember we talked about it, that it would have been lengthy, long sleeves, long to the feet. It was something that spoke more of royalty and not of a servant who is working. Um, we saw it in different ways being a picture of uh, Yeshua's robe uh, that we're made righteous in. I'm trying to summarize rather than go back and do a total review. That was in John 19, 23 and Matthew 27, 27 and 28. We saw that they um, took his robe and gambled for it the way that it had been foretold in prophecy. That was something that a person being crucified on a cross could not choose and say, take my robe and go gamble for it. That that's what they chose to do rather than to split it among the four who would have had rights to it. So uh, just seeing that the stripping of the coat, the stripping of the robe, the brothers threw him into the pit. The pit was a place that could hold somebody. Uh, often these pits were dry or they were um, murky, mucky, mucky, mucky is the better word, where, you know, it wasn't totally dry, but they would sink down into it. They were um, wider at the bottom, more narrow at the top. They could be 100 feet wide at the bottom, um, usually plastered, so they made great hiding places or prisons to hold a, a prisoner for a temporary period of time. We saw it happen to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, Jeremiah um, a number of times. And we saw that being thrown into the pit is a type of Sheol going into the heart of the earth, we know that Yeshua went into the heart of the earth when he uh, died on the cross. He did not go into hell. We went into that very clearly last time. He went into paradise, told the thief on the cross he would be with him in paradise that very day. That he went into the, the place of, um, of non-suffering and that he did not go into a place of torment. He did not need to do anything else. That's why he said on the cross, Tetelestai, it is finished. When he died on that cross, it, everything was done that needed to be done for our salvation. His blood was shed, and there was nothing else he needed to do. So, uh, moving on into verse 25, though, and here's where we'll pick up. Excuse me. Roger, I'm going to need that water. Sorry. Then they sat down to eat. Okay, so the brothers have just thrown him into the pit. Their, their intent really is to kill him from what we read earlier. Um, it was verse 20. Now then, come and let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits, and we'll say a wild beast devoured him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. Remember, they didn't like him because in his dreams he was telling them that he was going to rule over them. And he was the younger. They did not like that at all. So here they have now thrown him into the pit. They haven't killed him. We know that's their intent, but the callousness that we can see is they sit down to eat a meal. He's in that pit. I'm sure he's crying out, pleading to be brought out, not to be left in the pit. But he's in, in that pit while they eat, and it's a picture when Yeshua was going through that time where he's going to go to the cross. We have the Passover at that time. We have the Jewish people preparing to have that Sabbath, uh, or that, that Passover meal. Thank you very much. Hmm. And that's even going on when he, um, Yeshua was put on trial, and they even celebrated the Passover and the Shabbat that followed right on the hills at that time, which incorporates a meal also. 
while Yeshua is going to die and is dying and is buried in the tomb. So we see a comparison in that too. We can look at that even to this day and we can say it's a picture of the not yet believing Jewish people in what we call the church age, the called out assembly, and that they're just going on eating, drinking, being merry without realizing what they're passing by in the same way. So what happens? What's going to happen to Yosef? Is he going to be killed? What about the promises that God has made? What about his dreams? Are they going to come to an end? And of course, you all know the answers to those questions because God's word never fails. So what he has promised is what will happen. So we read in verse 25 after they sat down to eat that meal. And as they raised their eyes and looked, behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites was coming from Gilead with the camels bearing aromatic gum, balm, myrrh, and they're on the way to bring them down to Egypt. Okay, you may have the word company in your translation. That's fine. It's a caravan. It's a company that's together. Ishmaelites. The history of the Ishmaelites goes back to Abraham, Abraham by Hagar, that the Ishmaelites come out of that, that, that union. From Gilead, if you can call up that map that I gave you three weeks ago, Roger. If you can't, it's okay, because he's, he's in a, a temporary setup with his computer. But let me just tell you, Gilead probably originated from the Mesopotamia area. So no doubt there was a caravan constantly between these countries. Gilead was a plateau region. It was thickly wooded, wooded had a lot of treats. <laughs> okay, pardon me today. <laughs> It was east of the Jordan, so if he doesn't get it up, if you can picture in your mind the map of Israel, you know where the Jordan River is, okay? So it's east of the Jordan. It extended down about from the Sea of Galilee down to the Dead Sea. So we're, we're not quite to the middle of Israel. We're a little north of the middle and, of course, on the east side, okay? And if he gets the map up, then we'll go back and look at it better. My apologies because I forgot to ask him ahead of time. Uh, but it was lushly forested, and it was known for its bombs and its spices. So we even hear about the bomb of Gilead, and they'd use that for medical purposes. It was aromatic. It was called a resin. So depending on your version, um, do not we have... One or the other one. I don't think it's... No, it's not going to show in that one because we're too low, and yeah. I don't remember why, but we'll probably want those. If we haven't, we'll be wanting those. We're still too low. Those are all going to be the same. So there probably was another email, um, one before it or just after it. I forget because I study ahead which way we are. Sorry. But let me just say Ezekiel, Ezekiel 27. In fact, let's just run over there real quick. If you don't like to, you can stay in your uh, where you are, and I'll read it to you. Ezekiel, Hezekiel in our Hebrew, chapter 27, and verse 2 mentions it's going to call it a balsam here in, in uh, well, in the New American it will. Uh, and say to Tyre, who dwells at the entrance to the sea, merchants of the peoples to many coastlands, thus says the Lord God, O Tyre, you have said, I am perfect in beauty, and that does not have it. That tells us where we are. That gives us Tyre. Now go down to verse 17. That's where it lists the bomb, the balsam. Judah in the land of Israel, Judah in the land of Israel, they were your traders with the wheat of minneth, cakes, honey, oil, and balm. Or you may have balsam. They paid for your merchandise. So see, that was their way of exchange. They didn't necessarily have money exchanged, but they would exchange spices. They would exchange the medical healing uh, properties of a balm. Um, the complete Jewish Bible calls it a resin for healing. Any of those words are fine, but this is what it was known for, even to the point that we've taken and carried over that, that thought into the spiritual. And we pray for the balm of Gilead to touch and to heal people to this day. Came from this area, um, and, and one of the things it was known for. So this caravan's coming through. That's not a surprise, but the timing, of course, is God's timing. Back in Genesis 37, they see this caravan coming uh, from Gilead and all that they're bearing, and they're on their way down to Egypt. And so one of the brothers gets an idea. Judah, 
He's the older brother, and he speaks up, and he says to his brothers, what profit is it for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Cover it up, conceal it, you know, hide the fact. So he wanted to be rid of Yosef also. Maybe he was even fearing what, you know, if Yosef's dreams come true, he's going to lose that rulership that he thinks should be his because it would happen for the firstborn. And he doesn't want Yosef ruling over him either. But he's getting it, the idea, hey, let's do something that profits us, not just kill him off. So we read that he said, you know, what profit is if we just kill him? Come, verse 27, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. It's very interesting when you go into the root words that Judah that gives us Judah in our English here in Bereshit is the same root in Hebrew for Judas in our Gospels. So when you have Judas betraying the Lord for silver, you're going to see Judah betraying his brother for monetary gain. We see another comparison. This is number 29 in our comparisons between Yosef's life and Yeshua Jesus' life. Uh, but interesting how the name even plays it out. If you want to read of the um, of what Judas does in the Gospels, you can read it in Matthew 26, 14, and 15. I won't have us turn to it because I think we're all pretty familiar with it. So let's not kill him. Let's sell him. Let's not lay our hands upon him to bring death to him, uh, to slay him. And we hear the same thing in Yochanan John, and I am going to take you to that one. Uh, John 18, and I forgot to give you two. I've got cross-references if you want. I may not be able to find them fast enough. I think I gave away my only copy. You'll soon come on to... No, you won't. You probably won't get there today. I'll give you cross-references next week. Sorry, but any, any verses you need repeated, we can do it. Um, and the rest of you, it's in your email, remember. Um, but back on track. Go to Yochanan. Go to John chapter 18. And we're going to look at verses 28 and 31. John 18, 28, and 31. And here, whoops, I didn't type it right. Sorry, folks. Usually it's faster than this. Okay. <laughs> I'm having trouble today. I think I just need to not try so hard. John 18. There we go. Nope, I still have John 8. For whatever reason, my touch is not coming through. Maybe I just need to shift. There we go. Okay, sorry for the interruption as we move on. Then they led Yeshua Jesus from Caiaphas into Praetorium. It was early. They themselves did not enter the Praetorium. And I should tell you, this is the Pharisees. This is the Jewish people who are trying to bring charges up against Yeshua Jesus. They didn't go into the praetorium, into the place of government, because it would defile them, and then they could not eat the Passover. It's right there at Passover time. They have to stay ritually pure. They can't get involved in these civil affairs, these government affairs, but they still are part and party of leading Yeshua Jesus in for this trial that's going to happen. In verse 31, we read, so Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves, judge him according to your law. And the Jews said to him, We're not permitted to put anyone to death. Remember, they had to take him to the, the Roman authorities to be tried. That trial would sentence him to death, but it would have to be carried out by the Roman justice system. The Jewish people didn't have that freedom, and their mode of uh, execution would have been stoning him to death. It would not have been crucifixion. But it's a Roman cross that he dies on. That's why I try to make it very clear because I hear so much in the negative. First of all, Yeshua Jesus gave his life freely. No one took it from him. He laid his life down. The good shepherd that lays his life down for his friends. Secondly, it was not just the Jewish population that came against him. Yes, there were Jewish people in leadership positions who cried out for his death. There were Romans also crying out and caring out for his death. So we do not anathemize a people 
nor do we take what happened then and put it on the people today and say, well, the Jews are bad people because of what their leaders did then. Or, I don't hear it, but there could be those who say the Romans because of what happened then. That's not what it's about. It was our sins that put him on that cross. He went on willingly. He gave his life willingly. And we don't anathemize a people today. We praise God and thank him. We pray, I should say Yeshua, the two are one. But we thank him for his willingness to give his life for our salvation. But it's often used against the Jewish people. I have heard it myself personally, so I'm talking from personal experience. And it drives a wedge between reaching any Jewish people for their Messiah, for their Savior, when this is thrown in their face in a negative way. So, yes, I'm on my soapbox, but there's a reason for it. Maria, you have a question? No? Oh, okay, I saw, I thought, okay, my apologies. I thought I saw a hand up. <laughs> okay, so um, back on track. What we're seeing here, though, is that comparison. The brothers aren't going to lay their hands on him to kill him, but they're going to, in essence, see to getting rid of him. And the Jewish people who were charged with it at that time, the leaders who, who were charged with it also were not the ones that literally put their hands on Yeshua to carry out the crucifixion, but of course they were part of wanting him to be slain. So back in Genesis, we'll go back to Bereshit 37, and I believe we're still in, well, we're in 27, uh, verse 27, I think we're still in here. So the, the idea has come up now, let's not use our hands to do something against him. He is our own brother after all, he's our own flesh. And the brothers listened to Judah. So what happens? Um, let me let me bring out two because whether we get to it today or not, we're going to see. Uh, we won't get to it today. It's not. It's all the way in Genesis chapter forty-two. So it'll be a while before we get there. But chapter forty-two and verse four, verse twenty-one tells us that Joseph pleaded for his freedom. And they ignored him. So remember I said when he was in the pit and they were eating, he was probably crying out, trying to get them to, to get him out. And then he pled with them not to sell him off into slavery, going down into Egypt. Now, where's Judah in this role? Remember, he came up with the idea, let's, let's sell him. He might have thought it was better to sell him off than leave him in the pit to starve to death. Or what happens if he's in that pit, someone comes along, hears his cries, lets him out, he runs back home and tells their dad the treachery that the brothers were bringing on him. So in Judah's mind, he's either got to be put to death or he's got to be sold and out of the picture where they think he'll never be able to return. That's probably where he's at. He doesn't really want to put blood on his hands to kill him, but he's got to get rid of him. Okay? Verse 28, so, then some Midianite traders passed by. They pulled him up and lifted Joseph out of the pit. I want to stop there for a moment because the Midianites, we need to understand who they are. They're suddenly in the picture now. We talked about Ishmaelites earlier. Well, the Midianites were descendants of Avraham also by Keturah. Keturah is the wife that he married after Sarah had died. So, you've got Keturah bringing us the Midianites, and you've got Hagar bringing us the Ishmaelites, so they're cousins. And very often in Scripture, you see these two groups of people being related, working together, having their caravans together. It's not surprising. So it's not an incorrect use of the words in the Scripture. It would probably was, the caravan would probably made up of both, of some who were Ishmaelites and some who were Midianites. Um, the term Ishmaelite became the designation for desert tribes. It became a catch-all, and often the Midianite traders were known more as Ishmaelites because of that, whether they were actually one or the other. It just kind of became more of the popular name that was given. So they pulled him up. They drew and lifted up Yosef. It's a picture of a type of deliverance, and this will be... Um, the 31st way that our, our parallel draws between Yosef and Yeshua. Um, he's being taken up out of the prison. 
he's going to be turned over to the Gentiles. Yeshu was was taken from the pit that they where they um, beat him, and it was Gentile hands, Roman hands, that are going to carry him off into crucifixion. So it's not a picture of resurrection. It is a picture being turned over to the Gentiles. Yosef is going to be in Gentile hands now, going down into slavery. And here is what happened in the rest of that verse. They sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. This is number 32. Judas did the same thing to Yeshua. We read that, and I'll take you real quickly. Matthew 26, 15, just to prove my point. Remember, we back up everything with Scripture. We see it in Scripture or we don't believe it, and uh, where scripture's silent, we should be silent. Where it speaks, we should speak. Uh, Matthew 26, Matthew 26, verse 15, and said, uh, well, I mean, 14 tells us that Judas Iscariot is the one who's speaking, uh, and, and said, what are you willing to give me to betray him to you? And they weighed out 30 pieces of silver to him. From then on, he began looking for a good opportunity to betray Yeshua. So Judas is looking for money. The brothers are looking for money. This is our comparison. Um, we also see it in chapter 27 and verse 9, Matthew 27 and verse 9, to follow our thought through. Then that which was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. So here's the prophecy about Yeshua, and the prophecy is... They took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of one whose price had been set by the sons of Israel, and they gave them for the potter's field. So it goes on and tells what happens with that money. But let me take you also on the way back to Bereshit to stop off at the prophet Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 11, Zechariah chapter 11, verses 12 and 13, and in Zechariah... Chapter 11, verse 12, we read, I said to them, if it's good in your sight, give me my wages, but if not, never mind. So they weighed out 30 shekels of silver as my wages. Then the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, that magnificent price at which I was valued by them. I cut short, should have read more in Matthew for you. When Judas got that money and realized he had betrayed and, and felt the guilt of the betrayal, he threw the money back at those that had given it to him. They eventually take that money and they bought the potter's field with it. The potter's, potter's field was where they bury people who did not have the money to be buried by their families or, or someone else, and it would be called blood money eventually. So here we're seeing that that, that was prophesied happening to Yeshua. And here we're seeing Yosef's life being a parallel because for a certain amount of money, he's going to be sold off and it can be considered blood money because it's, it's equal to his death in essence. Um, the price that was fixed later, the price was for a, um, well, you see at one point for a young man um, or a boy, it was 20 pieces of silver or shekels. For an adult, a mature, it was 30 um, so that's only your difference. If you look at the money and say, well, why is it 20 here and 30 there? It was a young man, Joseph. It's a mature Yeshua. But it's the same thing. It was the price that was to be paid for a slave. Uh, let me show you Leviticus 27.5, the price that is set. That's in the law. Viagra, Leviticus 27 and verse 5. where we read, if it be from five years, even to 20 years old, then your valuation for the male shall be 20 shekels or for the female, 10 shekels. Male could do more work, so more value for the male. Okay, but again, then the price of the mature slave we see in Shemot in Exodus, and you can go there on your way back to Genesis with me, in Exodus 21 and verse 32. Shemot, Exodus 21, verse 32. If the ox scores a male or female slave, the owner shall give his or her master 30 shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. So there again, that's your only difference is the age. But the idea is that they're being sold off into slavery. So 
Back in Beersheba, back in Genesis 37, we have that he's being sold off to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver, just, you know, the difference with his age. And this is, again, the picture, uh, the number 33, Yeshua, Jesus, being delivered to the Gentiles, Yosef now in the hands of the Gentiles. And again, remember, the caravan would have been made up of those that either came from Ishmael, Hagar's line with Ishmael, or from Keturah, the, the line um, of the Midianites and the Ishmaelites. Again, both, both seeing them interchange. Another place in Scripture where you see the two of them mingling like that, you'll see it many times, but Judges, chapter 8, verses 24 and 26, show the Midianites and the Ishmaelites I'll call them kissing cousins, okay? <laughs> We're used to that expression. So in the mingling, judges. It should be in your cross-references. Yeah. Chapter 8, verses 24 and 26. So staying with Genesis, though, so we get far enough in it today for you, for you to feel like it was of value for you to come. Um, we have being sold off to the Ishmaelites. Thus they brought Yosef into Egypt. They took him in. He had no choice. He had to go. He's being sold, and his being sold is going to prepare the way for the fulfillment of God's word. We see this all the way through scripture. What am I talking about in relation to it being a prophecy for Yosef? Actually, the prophecy is Abraham's. Let me take you there. It's Genesis 15, because we were there so long ago, I don't expect you to remember it. But in Genesis 15, God made a promise to Abraham. And that's verses 13 and 14. And here he said, God said to Abraham, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. But I also will judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. Anyone know what nation we're talking about? Where does Israel go? Where does Israel go? And they go into slavery? Egypt. Egypt. For 400 years, they're going to go down into Egypt. They're going to come out with the wealth of Egypt, but they're going to be slaves in Egypt. That's what God foretold to Abraham would happen to his people. Where's Joseph headed? Egypt. Egypt. We've got the beginning of this being fulfilled. And we do know that they're going to going to follow Yosef down into uh, Egypt, and they're going to come up. We're celebrating it this week. <laughs> it's perfect timing. We're celebrating the coming out of Egypt. When they went down into Egypt, which is a little ahead of us, but when they go, about 70 to 75 people will go. That's the whole Jewish pop population at that time. When they come out of Egypt, it's estimated that they were about 2.5 million plus people that come out of Egypt. So they did multiply. That's why Egypt had trouble with them. But God kept his hand on them, fulfilled his word. Here's the beginning of it to Abraham. I love the way every word of our scriptures, of our Bible, is truth and is always fulfilled. If God said it, it will happen. Guaranteed. Oh, sorry, sorry. It's okay. It happens. I thought I it, <laughs> it happens. <laughs> Okay, so coming back into Bereshit, into Genesis 37, uh, we have, let's see, I want to pick up, I think, at verse 29. I think we're ready for it, because, yes, we have Joseph now in Egypt. Now, verse 29, Reuben, Reuben returned to the pit. Okay, apparently Reuben wasn't with the brothers when Joseph got sold off into slavery. He had to have been maybe off tending the sheep or whatever. For something has taken him away. Um, very likely he was looking after the flock while the rest sat and ate. Um, and then um, the others probably had left by this point because they are not in the picture. Reuben comes back to the pit. Doesn't seem like there's anybody else around. He comes back to the pit for a reason. He's wanting to free Yosef. He apparently, this is not setting well with him. So he returns to the pit, and behold, Joseph, Joseph was not in the pit. So he tore his garments. He tore them in grief. Here's the parallel also, number 30, 34, between Yeshua and Yosef. It's a type of sorrow of the Israelites 
who recognized the truth after the crucifixion. Let me show you where we read that. Go with me to Acts 2. Acts 2 is a powerful chapter. If you want to read the power of God and life-changing, wow. It's, it's the opening to this whole, what we call our age, our church age, of that the Sia is the coming of the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, on the day of Pentecost. Um, Kepha, Peter, he gives a sermon that, uh, well, let's just say he's one of the great pastors and great sermons <laughs> That you'll one of the greatest you'll ever read and, and hear. I'd, I'd love to hear, hear him giving it firsthand. Uh, jumping into it in verse 36 of chapter 2, it says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God, Elohim, God has made him, Yeshua, both Lord, Adonai, and Mashiach, Christ, this Yeshua, whom you crucified. He's just gone through the history with them and let the people know because this is the very generation that did cry out, crucify him. These are the very people who were alive at that day. This is 50 days past the crucifixion. Yes, 50 days. Sorry. <laughs> Had to think. 40 days Yeshua ascended. 50 days is Pentecost. So he's talking to people firsthand, and that's why he says, you're the ones who crucified him. Remember, they didn't with their own hands, but they were a party to it. Everyone was a party to it. Whether they were Jewish or Gentile, they were all party to it. And he's brought them through their Jewish history and brought out to them very clearly, this one, the one that you crucified, he's the one that God says is our Messiah, is our Savior, is our Lord, is God himself. And what was the response? Verse 37, now when they heard this, they were pierced to their heart, and they said to Kepha, to Peter, to the rest of the, the Talmudim, the apostles, brethren, what should we do? Notice the word brethren. Is Jew talking to Jew? Jewish people who were being reached by Jewish people with the gospel truth, it got them. Kepha gave them the word of God. He preached it great and it hit their hearts. They felt that grief, and what do we do? What do we do? And thankfully, at that time, these people in particular followed in repentance, and it, it goes on and tells that they were saved. So there are those who recognize the truth, who are pierced. I stand here as a Jewish person who is pierced in my heart, that he is my Messiah, that Yeshua Jesus is my Savior, that yes, he was crucified, but he rose from the dead, Hallelujah. I tell you all the time, the highlight of Israel is standing in an empty tomb. He is not here. He is risen. Hallelujah. You don't go looking for a relic. You don't, don't go looking for a bone. You don't go looking for dust. You go looking at an empty tomb. And if you don't feel the power of the Spirit of God in that tomb, then I guarantee you, you're not alive spiritually because you cannot stand in that tomb. And I've got at least one here that can witness. <laughs> I think I've got two who can witness, who, who are shaking their heads saying, yes, they've been there and experienced it also. So praise the Lord, even though many were lost, there were those who were saved. And we see it here also. So back into our, our Genesis, our account that we're dealing with here um, in chapter 37, we've got Reuben feeling the grief of it. He's, he's torn his garments he is sorrowing. He knows this is wrong. This is not right. He might have felt responsible being the oldest. He was at least, well, probably about six, seven years older than Yosef. So he's probably 23, 24 years of age. But he's the head of the brothers, being the oldest. What's he going to do? Go home and tell his dad? This is what we did. We threw him in a pit. I don't know what's happened. I mean, how could he tell his father what their intent was? Their intent was to kill him. He's got himself a major problem, and I think he had to deal with it for quite some time. We'll see as we move on. Verse 31. Uh, oh, maybe I missed a skip 30. I think I didn't get 30. I did not. 30. He returned to his brothers. He went and found the brothers and he said, the boy is not there. As for me, where am I to go? What do I do now? How do I tell dad? How do I deal with this? Oy, gavalt. So verse 31, they took Yosef's tunic. Remember, they'd stripped him of that, that special multi, um, well, it's called multicolored, but we talked about what that was back then. They slaughtered a male goat. They dipped the tunic in the blood. 
Okay, they're doing a cover-up, but notice there's shed blood. And here's type 35 is the type of the blood of the sin offering on the Day of Atonement. On the Day of Atonement is a goat. Remember, there's two goats, and the, the lot is, is stirred or whatever, and the lot falls on one goat to be killed in their place, the other goat to be taken out and let go out into the wilderness, never to be seen again, a picture of the sins being carried away. That blood had to be shared, shed Sorry for the sins to be taken away. So what a beautiful picture, even though it's sad of what's happening, that the fact that they took a goat and shed its blood is a picture of the shed blood of Yeshua, who took our sin and washed it away in his blood, never to be seen again. Type number 35 between Yosef and Yeshua Jesus. In verse 32, again, that long tunic, they've got it covered in blood now, the blood of that innocent goat. In verse 32, they sent the very colored tunic. They brought it to their father, brought it to Yaakov, Jacob, and said, We found this. Please examine it. Look at it. See, tell us whether this is your son's tunic or not. They knew. <laughs> but they're making Jacob realize. And look at it and see. And of course, he knew immediately that was a special um, uh, coat that he had given to his son. Here, though, we also can see type number 36. Because when they presented the tunic to the father, it had the blood on it. And Yeshua's blood was presented to the father. If you've been with me, you know how his, his blood was placed on the mercy seat in heaven. That it wasn't just the mercy seat in the temple. That's the temporary. But now that pure blood, sinless blood, human blood, could be placed on the mercy seat in heaven. Literally, the curtain of heaven, it's torn. We saw the curtain on earth torn in two. But the curtain in heaven is torn open, pinned back by nails, so that the entryway into the Holy of Holies, the presence of our Elohim, our God, made by the precious blood of the Lamb of God that has put his blood on that mercy seat for us. <sighs> wow. Wow, can you grasp that? <clears throat> Makes me speechless. Makes me speechless. And I've got a little more to say about that. It's either going to come up right now or it will come up shortly, but I want to take you to John, Yochanan chapter 20. It may be what's going to bring it up. Um, but some of you have been with me and you know I want to complete my thought for others who may not have been. In uh, Yochanan, John chapter 20, verse 17. Yeshua, yes, it is. It's coming up right here. Good, so I don't forget to complete my thought. Okay, I have to back you up and tell you what's going on. We have Mary standing outside of the tomb weeping, okay? She's seen the tomb is empty. She's so upset by it. She thinks they've stolen the body, and she presumes it's the gardener who's come and talking to her, and, you know, is talking to her, what's your problem? And she's saying, you know, they, they've taken his body away. I don't know where they've laid him. And she's in agony and grief over his death. But at the very least, she wants to at least anoint that body with the spices and follow through with the traditions that they would do at that time. And so she's so crying, she can't see. And in that, this one who she presumed to be the gardener, I love it. All he does is he calls her by name. He knows our names. And I can only imagine what it sounds like to hear the Lord call us by name. And when he called her by name, she knew in an instant, this was her master. This was her savior. And she turns to him from that grief. What are you going to want to do? Hug him. <laughs> you know, want to just throw your arms around him. And I'm sure the tears are just pouring like a flood at this moment. Very emotional moment. But Yeshua has to say something to her. And he says uh, in verse 17, stop clinging to me. Notice how it's, it's your, she is clinging, you know, stop clinging to me. I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brethren, go to my Jewish brethren, go to them and say, I ascend to my Father, Yeshua, recognizing God again as his Father, because Jehovah the, the Father, Yeshua the Son, and then we have the Ruch Kodesh, the Holy Spirit. So I have, I have sinned, Say to them, I ascend to my father. My father is also 
your Father, Jehovah, the same one, my God, my Elohim, your Elohim. And uh, then Mary goes on and she, she lets them know, goes on with the story. It's a very exciting story. If you don't know it, read it. If you do know it, read it again and be blessed. But did you notice what he said? Stop clinging to me because I have not yet ascended to my Father, your Father, my God, your God. Okay, look at the difference. Go down to verse 26 now in the same chapter. Yochanan, John chapter 20. In verse 26, Yes, verse 26. After eight days, so eight days later from what we've just read, he's with his Talmud, or the Talmudim were inside. I'm sorry, he's not there yet, okay? The Talmudim, the disciples, had gathered in a room together. And this time, Thomas was with them. Yeshua had appeared to the Talmudim before. We know different ones that he saw at different times. Read the, the Gospels and you'll get the story. But Thomas <coughs> hadn't seen him. And everybody rips Thomas apart. I don't. This poor guy loved Yeshua. He loved him. He never thought he would see him die. Remember, we read the whole story. We get everything taught to us. We get to look back at a complete picture. They're living through it. Yeshua had been warning them of his death. They weren't catching on. And when they were catching on, they weren't liking it. I wouldn't like it. If somebody I loved was saying to me, this is my future. I'm going to be crucified. No, 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 don't let it happen. Well, Thomas was so <laughs> blown away, to use the vernacular of today, by his death that he took off on his own. I think he went out, spent th those days totally by himself with his mind spinning, not knowing how to grasp it, not knowing how to make sense. He comes back and he gets told, good news, we've seen the risen Savior. And he's like, okay. This is too good to be true. You know, I, I've got to see it to believe it. I've got to feel it. I've got to touch it. I've got to know it or it's not true. He just needed, we've all said that, this is too good to be true. You know, and we're often warned, if you think it's too good to be true, it is. You know, look out, we're warned that way. So that's what's going on. Thomas is with them. His mind still shattered and, and trying to make sense of all this. And in this room, door is closed. And all of a sudden, boom, right in their midst, the living, resurrected Savior. <laughs> Yeshua Jesus is there. The doors have been shut. He stood in their midst, and he says, and he'll give it to you in my Hebrew, Shalom Aleichem, peace be to you. <laughs> wow. And then he said to Thomas, because he had heard, he knew, he's God, he knows it all. He had heard that Thomas had said, I won't believe unless I get to touch it and feel it for myself. So he turns to Thomas and he says to him, reach here with your finger, see my hands, reach here your hand and put it into my side and do not be unbelieving. Thomas, quit doubting. Don't be unbelieving, but believe. Here's the tangible proof. He could see the nail prints. He could feel the pierced side. This is real. This is tangible. And then he does go on. He says, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. And he's talking about us to this day. How many times have you heard, oh, this is just too good to be true. This is foolishness. No, I can't believe that's a fairy tale. But we know it to be true. We know it's tried and true and proven and never can be anything but because it is the true word of God. And so in this, we see the beautiful picture, the guarantee, the resurrection of the Son. But notice he tells Thomas, touch me, feel me, stick your hand in here. He doesn't say, hold it, wait a minute, I've got to go to my father. So something has changed between the time he was with Miriam in the garden saying, stop clinging to me, I've got to go to my father, and now he's seeing Thomas. And we know that even in between, he saw others also, and he did not stop any of them from touching. So what's happened? This is where we believe literally that he took his blood, miraculously took his blood, put it on the mercy seat in heaven, opened heaven's way, and it came back down to earth to live out the earthly days until he ascended 40 days later, to stay in heaven until he returns in that second coming.
that we read about in Revelation 19, where he is not coming lowly. He's not coming as servant. He's not coming as a lamb. He's coming as king of kings, lord of lords. He is coming with the armies of heaven with him. He is coming in regalia. He is coming on that white horse. He's coming with the name on his thigh, king of kings and lord of lords. And the sword out of his mouth, his very word, will annihilate the enemy, the Antichrist, and put a stop to the battle. And he will set up his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Hallelujah. Put a dot at the end of the sentence. It's done. It's finished. We have to live it out. But it is done because God said it, and I know it. Just as everything prophetically fulfilled to this point, everything will be continued. Everything, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> it could be my guess. It makes you want to. The angels are rejoicing. And you know what I love? We get all of this in Bereshit. We get all this in the beginning. We get all this in the first book. Anyone who wants to separate this needs to understand. It's one book. It's one long story. It starts in Bereshit and it ends in, and I tell you, the full title should be the first four words. In English, Revelation of Lord Jesus. In Hebrew, Revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach, of Jesus our Messiah. That's what it is. And it's given to us all the way back in the beginning. Passover gets me all excited because we have it from chapter 3 in, in Bereshit, in Genesis, all the way through. And in Revelation 5, he's the lamb, though he's been slain, who is ruling, who is the lion of the tribe of Judah. I've got a poster up here I'm pointing to. Lion and the lamb, that's our God. And we see it fulfilled and completed at the end of that last book. That's when you close the book and say, okay, now we've got the story. Now we've got the book. Don't divide it. Don't say, this is for Jewish people, this is for Christian people. <sighs> it's all. That, that will make my blood boil. <laughs> it's all for all, from beginning to end. Does God choose to work through the chosen race? Yes, because he wanted to bring it to the world, not to leave out, not to make second class. That's all man's doing. He brought it through a people to all the world. Beautiful story. Get off my soapbox. Come on back. <laughs> how can I not? You don't know how much I just left out that I'm dying to give you. <laughs> I, I got to... I had a great time Friday night with the message I got to give that on the lamb. Wow. I'm still bubbling with it, so forgive me. But we'll go on here. Type of Yeshua's blood being presented to the Father we have in Joseph's blood being presented to his earthly father and he's being told examine it look at it see it um, know if this is right don't be deceived know if this is truth and I will say for anyone follow the blood follow the bloodline in scripture and see if this not be true because the blood will lead you to salvation yeah. so follow it to the end and you will see unfortunately for Yaakov Jacob, he's in a time when he's going to see just the death. He's not going to see the resurrection. He does, in a sense, get a picture later when he finds out his son is still alive. But here we're finding out in verse 34 how much this is going to grieve this poor man's soul. So I think I need to back up before we get to 34. Um, okay, they dipped it in the blood in 31. They brought it to the father in 32 and said, examine it. So 33. Then he examined it and said, it is my son's tunic. And he jumps at the conclusion that they've set for him to fall into. A wild beast has devoured him. Yosef has surely been torn to pieces. He thinks his son has, has had a horrendous end to his life. So Yaakov does what they do when they grieve. He tore his clothes. He put on sackcloth on his loins, and he mourned for his son many days. Sackcloth was something like a gunny sack. It was a sign of grief, a sign of mourning, and he is so sorrowful. Verse 35 tells us how much he is, and there's two ways we can take it. I cannot tell you which is right. It said, then all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him. The rest of the family tried to bring him comfort, but he refused to be comforted, and he said, Surely I will go down to Sheol in mourning for my son. Uh, so his father wept for him. Now, when he says, Surely I will go down to Sheol, Sheol is where the body 
um, it was the, the burying, not where the body went. The body went into the ground, into the tomb. But the spirit would go into Sha'ol, either in the paradise side, if they were believers in the foretelling of the coming of Yeshua, or if they were not believers, into the, the um, torment the side, the, the suffering side. What did you call it? The other side. The other side, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, and Luke 16 tells us a great chasm in between the two sides, okay? So what he's saying is he's going to go down to, to death. Now, he could be meaning it's going to kill him, that he's so grieved he thinks he's going to die right now, or it could mean that he will grieve all the days of his life until he does die. That's what I can't tell you which was meant. You can ask him one day if it matters to you. The point is this grief was overwhelming and it wasn't going to let go of him. And when it mentions his daughters, we only know of one daughter. We only know of Dina, Dinah, the one that, that was, um, well, I'll just say it, she was raped. Um, but it could be daughters-in-law. We'll do the same thing. We'll call them daughters in love. We'll call them our daughters also. We bring them in and embrace them fully as family. It could be that the women, in his wives, had more daughters. But it kind of seems unlikely since we're given such a detailed um, genealogy. It seems a little unlikely. But again, um, it was either daughters that had not been mentioned and weren't mentioned because nothing happened in their lives significant that we needed to have in our records. We know we do have limited God said, I can't write it all down for you. You couldn't carry it around. He didn't say that. We say it that way. But you know what I'm saying, that we have what we need to have for our understanding. But, of course, far more took place. We don't know what happened every day of the lives. Think of Methuselah. What did he do for 969 years? You know, We know it in, in a couple of verses. We don't have 900 years of his journals. But either way, is the scriptures are true. Either way, it's referring to the daughters-in-law in love as daughters, or there were more that were not named because we don't need the details. Um, when we see it again, it will come up in chapter 46, so I'll, I'll show you that real quickly. You can take a little quick jaunt over there with me if you want. Chapter 46, verses 6 and 7. We have, they took their livestock and their property that they had acquired in the land of Canaan and came to Egypt. This is when they're going to go down into Egypt for survival. Yaakov, Jacob, and all his descendants with him, verse 7, his sons and his grandsons with him, his daughters and his granddaughters, and all his descendants he brought with him into Egypt. So again, it's referring to the girls in plurality, whichever way it, it means it to be. And verse 15 in that chapter also says specifically, these are the sons of Leah, whom she bore to Yaakov and Padan Aram with his daughter Dina. All his sons and his daughters, number 33. So his immediate family, there were 33 of them. And if you try, go into the genealogical charts with what you get from scripture. Believe me, if you try to figure it out, you're going to make yourself crazy. <laughs> It's just, I'll take it either way. Either they're unnamed girls or they were the daughters-in-law. doesn't matter. We know it's accurate. And that's all that matters is the accuracy. So back in chapter 37, and we are ready, I think, for verse 36, I think. No, not quite. Not quite. Yeah, but hold on. We're going, we're going to stop here. Also, I want to cover a couple more points. So we've talked about the, the daughters trying to comfort him. We talked about how he can't be comforted all this life he's going to suffer with it, whether that's short or long. Um, so his father wept for him, but he said, surely I will go down. Down gives us that direction where Sheol was. We know it to be in the heart of the earth because Luke 16 gives us that explanation of it. We will go there uh, uh, quickly because I think it's important. If you have not seen it pointed out, it'll just reaffirm if you have. But on the way, I'm going to stop off in Isaiah, Yeshiahu, Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 14. Isaiah 5 and 14 says, Therefore, Sheol has enlarged his throat and opened his mouth without measure. And Yerushalayim's splendor, her multitude, her din of revelry, and the jubilant within her descend into it. Isaiah's time at a time when Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, is going to be um, 
massacred. What's the word I want? It's going to it's going to crumble. Okay, in judgment, there is going to uh, be death for many there. And it's saying when that happens, Sheol opened his mouth to receive so many people. Hmm. So it's speaking about literal death that the, the spirits of those bodies go into the heart of the earth. Now, let me take you to Luke 16 for understanding. And in Luke 16, we're going to be given a story. I don't say it's a parable because we have someone named. And anytime Yeshua spoke in parables, which was an object story, it was a story to teach something he was trying to teach, he would not use real names. He would talk about the farmer, he would talk about the son, but he wouldn't use names. The fact that he put a name of a real person on it meant this is not just a story to teach something, this is a real life event, okay? So when we read in Luke 16, starting with verse 16, uh, why do I start with verse 16? I think I wanna start with verse 19. I want to start with verse 19. Sorry, folks. Luke 16, starting with verse 19. There was a rich man. He habitually dressed in purple, fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. Now, here comes the name. Verse 20. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores, longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. So you have a very rich man living in opulence, and right outside his gate you have poor Lazarus who's living a miserable life, living a life of poverty, obviously ill health, has sores, and, and the only healing for his sores are the dogs trying to even lick his sores. Horrible. The poor man dies, verse 22. He's carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. That's a euphemism for the side of paradise that those who went into Sheol in the paradise went into the arms of Abraham. They were brought into his bosom because Abraham was one of the ones early on, being one of our early patriarchs, who had passed away. He was in the heart of the earth, and so his it just kind of took on his name to teach people as they come down the line, okay? So... The poor man's gone into the, the what we'll call the paradise side because we know other scripture refers to that. Now, the rich man also died and he was buried. His body buried. He's dead. He's no mistake. And it says in Hades. That's because we're in the, the Brich Hadashah, the New Covenant. We're in a book that used Greek to, get, uh, to uh, tell the story to the people who were Greek-speaking of the day. Okay, like we speak English predominantly throughout the world today, Greek was the predominant language then. But the Greek Hades is equal to the Hebrew Sha'ol, one and the same. It's just whether you're saying it in Hebrew or whether you're saying it in Greek. The same way when I say Yeshua, I'm speaking of Jesus in English, Yeshua is the Hebrew way to say it. So it's, that's the only reason for the different name here is this was a Greek um, uh, book that was written... Uh, to talk to the, to tell the Greek people, Greek speaking people. So he in Hades is where he went. In Hades, in Sheol, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. Okay, he saw Abraham. He saw him far away. So he's not in Abraham's bosom. He's not on the paradise side. He is far away, and he sees him. He sees that Lazarus is over there. So we know we've got what's going on now. We've got. Two different areas, one suffering and torment, and one paradise. Okay? <clears throat> so he cries out. He says, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue. I'm in agony in this flame. So we get the idea the torment of the other side is flame, is fire. We know we have other scriptures that talk to us about the word hell being a lake of fire. It all is fitting together. It's not a fire that consumes, it's a fire that continually burns. And if you've ever been near fire, that's horrible enough right there. Um, so he wants Lazarus to come over and just cool off his tongue. If nothing else, just do that. But Avraham says, child, he's talking to that rich man. 
Remember that during your life you received good things, and likewise Lazarus in his life received bad things, but now he is comforted here, and you're in agony. And besides all this, there between us, between us and you, there's a great chasm, a great gulf, fixed, so that those who wish to come from come over from here to you will not be able. If Lazarus even wanted to go do it, he can't. He can't cross that chasm. And that none may cross over from there to us. They'd all want out. They'd all want to go across to the paradise side. Who wouldn't? But they can't do it. There's no ability to go across that great um, gulf that is there. It goes on and it says, he said, Then I beg you, Father Abraham, that you send to my father's house. I have five brothers in order that, they, that he may warn them so they won't come to this place of torment. He's saying, well, okay, if I can't get out of this, I don't want my brothers coming here. Send someone to go tell, tell my brothers about this so they won't go there. But Abraham answered and he said, they have Moses, they have Moshe, and they have the prophets. They have the word of God. Let them hear them. But he said, no, Father Abraham, for if someone goes to them from the dead, then they'll repent. If Lazarus shows up resurrected, they'll believe it. And sadly, Abraham answers, Abraham answers, and he said, If they do not listen to Moshe and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. And I'll take you to Yeshua rising, being on this earth 40 more days, walking among people who saw him crucified. And we do not read of the masses coming to believe. How sad and how true. And even to this day, if that's all it took was seeing someone resurrected, God would do that so that the world would get saved because he's not willing that any should perish. But they won't believe it. So there is this total separation. There is uh, the truth of the spirit goes somewhere when it leaves the body. It either goes in a place of paradise or a place of torment. Now, I don't have time to do it and do it justice of just in a nutshell, when Yeshua put his blood on the mercy seat in heaven, when we talk about that point, open the way into heaven, now heaven is able to receive those who were sinners because their sin is no longer just covered by an animal's blood. It's now been washed away so that it's gone, never to be seen, and they stand in appearance sinless, because they stand in the righteous robe of Yeshua before God, so he can allow them into heaven now. That's why when Shaul Paul speaks about leaving this earth, he said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Well, where is the Lord? Where is he now? In heaven. At the right hand of the Father, sitting on the love seat built for two. I love it that way. <laughs> He's in heaven. He's not in the heart of the earth. He is in heaven. So there is a time, and Philippians gives us this. I think it's chapter 2. It's either 2 or Ephesians 4. I should have looked it up ahead. I'll get you the reference. We'll get it onto the video. He talks about how he led captivity captive. When you had victory... You took an entourage of those people who you were victor over now through the, the main street of the city, showing everybody, look, this is my booty. This is what I have won, so to speak, in war. Well, Yeshua, winning the battle over death, the battle over the punishment of sin, the wages of sin is death. Now he could take Sheol, the, the paradise site, all those that had looked forward to his coming, who believed in his coming, now he's come, now his blood is in place, now they are washed in the blood of the Lamb, now they are victorious, resurrected, they can have the, the righteous robe, and they can go into the presence of God now. And that's what happens to a believer who dies today. They don't go into the heart of the earth into Sheol because that's been emptied out and taken into heaven. They get to go immediately into the presence of the Lord. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. The holding tank for the unsaved, I believe, is still in the heart of the earth. I believe that those who die today without salvation are still going into the heart of the earth. 
There is a time that they will be brought up and stand before God in judgment. It's called the great white throne judgment. No believers stand at that judgment for judging. They, they stand there as eyewitnesses so that somebody might stand before God and say, well, nobody ever told me. And Ron will say, um, excuse me, remember that day? And he could even give the date if need be. And he'll say, I tried to tell you, but you wouldn't believe me. We may stand there and do that, but we don't stand before God for judgment. We're watching his judgment of those who have never received, who died without receiving salvation, who will go into that lake of fire forever. If you catch that and what that really means, the torment, the suffering, the separation from God, holy, love, light, truth. It'll put you on your knees to pray for everyone around you that you be a light to them in the darkness. Bring them the words of life and pray that they'll have eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to receive that they won't stand before God at that judgment one day. Dora. But that's not going to be until a thousand years from wherever. That's at least a thousand and seven years from now. <laughs> And why I say that is I do believe in a rapture of believers who will suddenly disappear because the Lord comes in the air, meets them in the air. He does not come back down to earth. That's why it's not second coming. First coming, his feet touch on earth. They walked in Jerusalem and Galilee and all over Israel. Second coming, his feet will touch the earth. They will walk in Jerusalem. They'll walk all over the Mount of Olives. He'll set up his kingdom. That's a first coming and a second coming. He comes with his saints in the second coming. That's Revelation 20, where we get 19, sorry, where we get the picture of him coming, as I described earlier when I said that that, that sword out of his mouth would annihilate the Antichrist, stop the battle, set up his kingdom. Chapter 20 tells us about that reign of his kingdom on earth, a thousand years. Six times in what, 12 verses, 13 verses? It says millennium, millennium, millennium. Well, if the Lord says it once, believe it. If he says it twice, hear it. If he says it a third time, okay, I get it. I'm not dense. Well, for any who may be dense, fourth, fifth, and sixth time. <laughs> that I say that because there are those who say it's not literal. Hello. Why did he say it six times if it's not literal? You know, that's a thousand years that he will reign on this earth. There will be peace that this earth has never known. I cannot imagine an earth like that. I can't turn on the news and hear happy news. I turn on the news and I hear murder and mayhem that's only getting worse. We're concerned for our college campuses today. We're seeing an outbreak of evil. What Hamas did, mm. oh, yeah. this earth needs that. And it will only have a thousand years of peace because the Lord is ruling and reigning with a rod of iron and that's why he keeps in line. But at the end of that time, then... Satan is let out of the bottomless pit. He goes through the earth for all those who just faked that they believed in Messiah and were one with him. They get to show their true colors. They want to follow Satan. They want to come up in the face of the Lord. They want to dethrone him and put Satan on that throne. And can you imagine what this world would be like with him on the throne? Hallelujah, the Lamb. They come up and they're gone. It's done. It's over. There's not even a battle. It's and, and no memory. And, yeah, and Satan's thrown into the lake of fire forever, where the beast and the false prophet already are. But now, after that's been completed, that's when we read about the great white throne, where all those who have died since the beginning of time, all the way through time up until that point, who died without faith, without believing in Yeshua, now they will stand before God for their judgment as to what their eternal status will be. The only thing I can say to that, apparently there's a way that some will suffer greater than others. Those who have done horrendous deeds that deserve a punishment worthy of it versus a little old lady who didn't harm anybody but never put faith in the Lord. So God is a fair and just judge. He knows how to do that. I leave that in his hands. I cannot speak to that because he does not explain that. I don't even want to know because all I know is I don't care 
the, the best in hell is the worst because it's without God, without love, without light, without... I mean, it's just constant suffering. And I just... It, it's just horrendous. It's just horrendous. I went through an, a, an experience in my life I do not wish on others where a neighbor lost his life in a house fire. I ran to that house. It was not in danger. I don't believe I was. But the point is... The fire was around. At the same moment that there was light from a fire, it was dark. It was horrendous to breathe, to see. The experience lives with me to this moment. I was with that. Okay, you've been through it too. It shook me to my core. And then when you know someone lost their life. I have hope he's in heaven. I don't know, but I have hope he is. That's enough just enough. That's not the reality of hell, but it's bad enough. I just want to say to you all, please take this to heart today. Please, in love, not in force, but in love, talk to your friends. Talk to your neighbors. Talk to whoever the Lord puts in your path. Pray for opportunity. Look for a way. Don't be afraid. God says, you open your mouth, I'll fill it. And he does. You'll watch yourself do it. You'll be amazed because it's not you. It's the Spirit of God in you. But this is real and this is life. And nobody's guaranteed tomorrow. No. I've got 1,200 people that lost their lives on October 7th. Some of them still in bed. They didn't know it was going to be their last day. No. Turn on the news at night. How many of those people that you hear lost their life that day, woke up that morning and said, this is the end of my life? Mm -hmm. You know, we don't know. We don't know why am I on my soapbox for this today. I don't know. But I hope it's because the Lord's speaking to a heart that he's urging you, go talk to somebody. If the Lord's putting someone on your heart, please do it. Don't put it off because no one's guaranteed another day. I'm watching my time go. I want to wind up. Let me get back to um, chapter 37. And for those of you with me the first time, I hate to say it, but this is probably a pretty usual class. I do tend to have... Um, Moments where I, hopefully I'm speaking by the Spirit of the Lord, um, but we don't always go off on as many tangents as I've done today. Um, but again, I, I trust, I pray for every word that, that is taught in this class to be anointed and to be the Word of the Lord. And that I always ask the Lord, let truth be spoken but let it only be heard as truth. So if I speak it wrong, the Holy Spirit's changing it, making it right in your ear to go into your heart because it's His Word, the living Word of my God, and I am not worthy. I'm like Isaiah. Oh, woe is me of unclean lips. We are looking at the end of verse 35, back in Bear Sheep 37, um, that he'd go down into Sheol mourning for his son, so his father wept for him. Jacob wept for Joseph. And then we have verse... Um, oh, yeah, I did cover that. Sorry. Okay, so then we have verse 36. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, Pharaoh's officer, the captain of the bodyguard. And in one verse, we've got a whole picture of what's coming. It's just like, wow, before we close this chapter, let me give you a sneak peek. <laughs> you know, here's what's coming. The captain of the bodyguard, that's uh, usually the chief of the executioners, and that's the way the Hebrew phrases it. So it probably referred to a person who maybe even handled the slaughtering of the animals for the royal kitchen, um, the animals used for sacrifice, but it also would be someone who would be in charge of the prisoners being overseeing the prison. We see that in chapter 40 and verse 3. I'm going to take you there real quickly. 40 and verse 3 we have. So he put them in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard in the jail, the same place where Yosef, Joseph, was imprisoned. So Joseph's going to go into prison. He's going to go into place that he's being held as prisoner. And he's gone in that because the one who, who bought him, because remember he's being sold as a slave, is the one who's the head of that prison house. Okay, so the Midianites sold him in Egypt. He was sold to Potiphar. Potiphar's the name. He's Pharaoh's officer. He's Pharaoh, one of Pharaoh's men with a high up position overseeing 
all of this possibility. Definitely overseeing the prison, maybe overseeing the slaughtering of animals, keeping the, the food, you know, which he'd be responsible for um, that food not being poisoned because, you know, how leaders always were <laughs> worrying about those who wanted to kill them and, and take their place. So um, I, I see, and I'm going to wind it up here because usually I don't stop on time, and for once I can. <laughs> but chapter 38, where we're going to open next week, we're going to take a jump in time. We're going to be about 22 years um, from the time that, Yos that Jacob... Okay, let me say it right. It's about 22 years from this point to when Jacob goes down into Egypt, okay? We know that's what's coming. Yaakov is going to go down into Egypt, but Yosef is here ahead of him. We'll look at that. We'll look back over it, and we'll see their significance that, that time is passing, and I don't want us to... to lose that. I try to keep us in the continuity as we're moving forward, but we're going to see. By the time we get Yaakov to come down and see his son, know his son is alive, we're going to have a span of over 20 years take place. There are a couple of very important things that happen to Yosef between this time. He's 17 now, and he's being sold as a slave, and by the time he's brought up, for, I'm, a, I'm a spoiler, I tell you part of the end of the story, by the time he's put up as ruler, he's 30. By the time his brothers see him, he's 39. So time is going to pass, okay? And we'll deal with that in chapter 38. So um, I hope you want to come back and hear what happens, the significant points in his life. Uh, we'll go on. Um, I believe we're coming up still with some more of those comparisons I had said it was all in this chapter, but if I remember right, maybe not. Maybe I'm at the end of the comparisons that I was going to give us. If so, we, we did 36 comparisons anyway in this chapter between Yosef and Yeshua. Now, tell me, how can this book be written by mere man and not be of any more value than Aesop's fables or any other stories, even history books that are written, if that's all it is? But prophecy alone, the foretelling, the foreshadowing, the pictures, to see the Lamb and the way that it's shown the picture all the way through, all of these different ways, let us know this is an errant word of God. This is not man done. Yes, man wrote it, but he wrote it as the Holy Spirit, the Ruch HaKodesh, anointed him to write. So that I believe he even wrote what he didn't understand, what he didn't fo fully see and fully know. Because God was the one that was writing it. God is the author of the book. And you can trust it for your life because it never fails. If God said it, you can believe it. If God promises it, it will happen. Does it happen the way you think? Not necessarily. <laughs> That's where people get off track. And they don't leave it at this is God's and his will and his way and he rules and he reigns. So when they get themselves in the way, and that's called pride, then, well, you know, God didn't do it the way he said. He didn't do it the right way. Well, hello? Really? Do you want to tell God that? <laughs> <laughs> when you're God and you make the world and the rules, then you can say how it goes. But <laughs> you need the check. If you're not lining up with the scripture, you need the check, not the word of God. You can try it. Try it every way you want. Try it with archaeology, try it with math, try it with science, try it in your life. And I guarantee you, it will not fail, it will not come short, it will not disappoint you, and it will never lie. It's the Word of God, truth. Yeshua Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. And there's our answer for every other way that people want to get to God. It's Yeshua, and it's Him only, and hallelujah, He spelled it out. And I love it, as Dr. David Jeremiah says, He put the cookies on the bottom shelf so even the kids could get the, the joy of it. They can understand it and know, even as a little child can understand and know and accept as Savior. It's that simple. Is that not a magnificent plan? And is that not a magnificent God? And on that note... Let's close in prayer. Praise Him and thank Him, and we'll have any questions, comments, discussion you want. Oh, Lord God, 
Adonai Yeshua, but how you enable us to expand a little bit more and love you a little bit more amazes me. But we do. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. Your word is alive and powerful, life-changing and life-enabling. And how we thank you for your precious word, for loving us so, for wrapping us up in your arms that, that are yours, and for leading us in every moment of our lives. As we all go out in our different ways this day and this week, Lord, use us. Use us to your glory. It seems that you've put on our hearts to be a witness and a light and truth through this class. May we be so, not using our own words and not trying to do anything in our own power, but by the power of your spirit within us. May we be a living testimony to one who is dying in this world. And may it be through this seed planet or seed water that it will sprout forward and they will come into eternal life also. Thank you for promising it to us and that you do not take back what you have promised, that it is a gift we receive and we know it is ours forever. So we praise you and thank you and look forward to that day of grand reunion with you. But until that moment we are home, may we serve you in whatever and every way you would have us to do. Bless and be with each one. Meet every need on every level, physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, Lord. May they look to you and see all and receive all that they need because you are Jehovah Yira. You are the God who provides and you are the one who loves us so that you gave your life that we might live. <sighs> Dayenu, it would have been enough, but you do even more. You give us abundant life and we praise you forever and ever. In the name of our holy God and our precious Savior, Elohim, Hayim, Most High God, Yehovah, Yeshua, Jesus. Amen. 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 I'll be asked to, again, as I wake up call Sunday morning, he 